Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this tutorial Well, I will uh, introduce the uh, container storage interface primitives and how to use those in Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Michael Madsen, uh, I'm a tech marketing engineer and master technologist with the Hulu Packet Enterprise. I'm presenting this at uh, KubeCon Virtual 2020 and uh, if you're watching this uh, live, uh, thank you so much for hanging in there. This is on the last day. And if you're watching this as a rerun, thank you so much for, for watching this content. I hope you find it interesting. And so um, this tutorial uh, is basically all about CSI and what you can do with it in Kubernetes. And that is sort of the introduction to CSI that I'm going to talk about, some of the CSI drivers that are out there and what CSI is. The, the, Second part of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about dynamic provisioning of pers persistent volumes in Kubernetes. It, I think it's important that we kind of nail down the basics uh, before we go into the more advanced topics. And I also want to talk a little bit about how pods and controllers attach to persistent storage, as that is also a very um, important primitive to understand while working with persistent storage. Um, the more fun stuff kind of begins when we start talking about CSI snapshots and using data sources in your persistent volume claims uh, to be able to clone external storage uh, into a new pod uh, and, and leverage data sets that already exist uh, on your storage system. Uh, using raw block volumes is something that uh, is uh, introduced in CSI as well. It's been around for a while. I'm um, going to show you how that works and how the, those different use cases uh, around using raw block volumes work. Uh, another interesting concept is uh, using ephemeral volumes uh, with the with your uh, with your pods, and that basically makes your external persistent storage volume act like it w is a container, right? And there are various different ways on how to attach those <laughs> ephemeral volumes to your uh, to your pods, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that works. Uh, at the end of the <clears throat> at the end of the presentation, uh, I will kind of summarize what we talked about, and there will also be a live Q and A, right? So this session is pre-recorded, uh, but at the end of the session, uh, there will be a live Q and A. I will be there in person, answer any questions you might have on this presentation, or or anything that kind of relates to this subject. Uh, I will also hang out in the Slack channel. And I've been I've been in the Slack channel for throughout the the event as well. And and one important detail I kind of want to touch on uh, as well here that uh, I'm obviously going to deploy a lot of YAML files and and things like that and and run through a lot of hands-on labs. Uh, I got uh, eleven hands-on labs for you, uh, so this presentation really goes to eleven. Um, and I kind of put together a, a GitHub repo where all these. Uh, config files, and there's also uh, ask an email cast files. So this, if there's anything you actually in, see in the demo uh, in the video, you can use the cast files and play them, play them on your local computer and basically copy and paste the text from, from the demo, right? Because uh, that is really difficult to capture from, from a video file into a terminal. And so that is the repo that we are uh, gonna use uh, throughout the entire tutorial. So let, let me uh, uh, start off here and kind of talk a little bit about what is CSI. Uh, you know that CSI stands for Container Storage Interface, but uh, what, what is actually behind it? Uh, so it's basically a specification, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a set of specifications and, and the lack for a better comparison, it's sort of like the cinder for Kubernetes, right? With the benefit of that the drivers and the entire frameworks live outside the, um, the, the, the main Kubernetes project, right? So the drivers and, and all the uh, sidecars, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this later, they, they, they not, they're not part of the main Kubernetes uh, upstream uh, tree, right? So the, the sidecar lives in their own repos, all the CSI drivers are delivered by vendors in, in, in various different ways, right? Uh, it's also governed by the uh, special interest group, uh, Kubernetes SIG storage. Uh, they meet on a regular cadence. And uh, I also put some links here into the um, CSI doc documentation itself. And I'm gonna reference that in, a, uh, in, in, uh, in some of the demos as well uh, on how you kind of find stuff and such. And the main goal for the uh, CSI specification is to provide uh, an interface standard on how to 
provision and attach storage to container orchestrators that is often uh, referred to as a CO, right? And we're obviously going to talk about Kubernetes today, uh, but you can also use uh, CSI for Nomad or Cloud Foundry and Mesos, and, and those are like the, the less popular ones. I know that Nomad just got CSI support uh, in, 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 um, in that container orchestrator as well. So we'll probably see uh, a few more uh, use cases for that com coming up. Uh, so I just want to kind of touch a little bit on the history of um, CSI, how, how it kind of came to be, right? So if, you, if we kind of go back to the early days of Kubernetes, uh, we had these like entry persistent volume plugins, right? And the two example plugins I have here, like Fiber Channel and iSCSI, and they were kind of introduced in Kubernetes 101, iSCSI in 0 0.15, right? But there's a, a slew of different plugins uh, in the that is part of the main Kubernetes distribution, right? And somehow this became really unwieldy really early on because what happens is that every vendor needed to uh, learn how to contribute to Kubernetes, right? And that wasn't really an easy feat back then, right? And and everything needs to be code reviewed, and you also stuck to the release cadence of Kubernetes. And that prohibits the vendor to kind of innovate at his pace and all, always have to wait for the next release for new features or bug fixes and things like that. And, and that was pretty unmanageable. <clears throat> uh, what came along in uh, Kubernetes 1.2 is the Entry Flex Volume plugin. And, and that in, uh, introduced the concept of uh, allowing vendors to, to write Flex Volume drivers. And flex volume drivers were kind of useful. It was a pretty decent stopgap, uh, but somehow that become, uh, became very uh, unuser friendly as well, right? Because the flex volume driver itself, it, it was a, it's a self-contained binary that needed to be needed to reside on every uh, kubelet in the cluster that was supposed to attach persistent storage. And it did not have uh, any uh, dynamic provisioning uh, support either. So if you had a, if you were a vendor and want to provide a flex volume driver, you also had to write your own provisioner uh, to be able to uh, satisfy persistent volume claims with that driver. And um, and that's what kind of when, when we kind of move into the, the phase of the container storage interface, it, it's just completely lives outside of Kubernetes. There's like nothing inside Kubernetes that depends on uh, the CSI, the, the delivery vehicles of CSI or the velocity of how things are uh, introduced and such, right? And the entire framework is actually deployed on top of Kubernetes, right? So nothing lives in tree. And that allows vendors then to, uh, once you have all the CSI sidecars and such in, installed on your Kubernetes cluster, Vendors can then provide their CSI controller driver and their CSI node driver, right? And that is uh, the vehicle that I'm going to talk about today on how to uh, install CSI drivers and how to use the particular feature that a CSI driver provides. <clears throat> so I also have this uh, simplified um, architecture view of, of CSI, right? So you kind of have the, the sidecars that I've been talking about. Uh, first, you have the node driver registrar, and you will see like on every node that have CSI drivers on them, you will see what drivers they have and some of the features that they provide, like topology keys and such. And, and then you have the all the sidecars, like the provisioner, the attacher, the resizer, the snapshotter. Uh, they are all provided by the Kubernetes SIG storage community, right? And then you have the external components, uh, which is the CSI controller driver and the CSI node driver that that then then talks to a, um, a external storage system. The storage system can actually run on Kubernetes itself, or it can be outside the cluster entirely, right? So if you have like an external NFS server or a block storage server, uh, that can live entirely outside. And then you have the container native storage uh, or container attached storage solutions that are out there where you actually deploy everything on your cluster uh, as well, right? Uh, the communication that is uh, between the sidecar images and, and the, um, the controller driver and the node driver is using uh, a gRPC interface. So 
some of these components they need to run on the same nodes, but the external storage system or the storage system component, they, they can talk over an entirely different uh, uh, interface, like using REST and iSCSI and, and whatnot. Uh, another uh, de detail you can see up there in the, um, in the uh, light bulb there is that CSI drivers today, they may provide either file or block storage. Uh, and we're also seeing that um, there are a few uh, Kubernetes enhancement proposals uh, around providing object storage with sort of similar uh, semantics. So we're surely looking forward to that. And we all, all almost have uh, over a hundred drivers. Uh, there's 90 some drivers available today, right? So if you go to the, the URL that is on the slide there, uh, you will see uh, the list of the, the different drivers and also what kind of features uh, that they support. Uh, so I'll, I'm gonna use uh, the HPE CSI driver for Kubernetes in the hands-on labs and such, but it doesn't really matter what CSI driver you use, as long as it supports the different features uh, and, and the different specification levels uh, of the CSI specification. And if you pull up this page, uh, you will then be able to see that there are certain aspects uh, of each individual driver, right? So I, I just took a good example here in the driver list, uh, uh, Ceph FS and, and Ceph RDB, which provides block storage. And they provide um, sort of like different uh, aspects uh, of the spec that it supports and, and different features, right? So uh, we can see that um, the modes that the driver support is persistent. It doesn't support ephemeral. So the mode can be either persistent or ephemeral. Uh, the access mode, if you look at CephFS, they can do read-write multiple pods. I'm going to talk about that uh, later uh, in this tutorial, what that actually means. Uh, but this is just a way for you to kind of assess the different drivers depending on your use case. You can see that the block storage uh, driver will only support read-write a single pod. And different features that are very similar. The only difference here, what you can see here, is that the... Um, the raw block uh, volume or the, the block volume driver will support raw block and it will also su support topology. And, 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 and those keys are not needed for using Ceph, the file system component, right? Because it's a distributed file system, will be available everywhere and it does not have any block cap capabilities, right? So depending on your use case, what kind of apps you're de deploying, you kind of want to assess the driver list to make sure that uh, the driver you're using support the, the specific capability that you're looking for. All right. <clears throat> so these are the different features that we're going to talk about today and, and kind of run through the different tutorials uh, for provisioning storage and uh, show you how um, to attach raw block volumes and and so forth. And these all have different maturity levels within Kubernetes today, right? We have the, the, the features made GA and a few uh, beta features. And we also have one alpha feature we're gonna talk about today, uh, the gen generic ephemeral volumes. It got, got introduced in 119 and it's a pretty neat uh, addition to if you compare that to the ephemeral local volumes. And I'm gonna talk in, in depth about the difference uh, around that when we get there. Um, so, this is, and this is also something you need to consider uh, when you want to use persistent storage with your workloads in Kubernetes. And it's also uh, the fact that different Kubernetes distributions, they may, may mature these features on, 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 on a different cadence or a faster cadence, depending on um, the particular use cases that particular vendor want to cater for. So. Uh, that is also something to keep an eye out, out, eye out on. And all these different features are uh, described in depth um, uh, on the uh, Kubernetes CSI GitHub repo as well. And we're going to cover most of these. Uh, I'm not going to talk that much about topology. I'm going to touch a little bit about that when we walk through the storage class. Um, volume limits, I'm not going to talk about that either, but that's a way for the uh, CSI driver vendor to put a node limit on um, uh, on the node, how many volumes you can provision from that particular driver to that particular node, which is quite useful. Uh, but the rest of the capabilities here, I'm gonna show volume expansion, ephemeral local volumes, volume snapshots, and also use uh, 
persistent volume clone uh, using the data source uh, stanza in the persistent volume claim. So we have uh, a full agenda uh, for sure. And so we're kind of approaching the first kind of hands-on lab here, right? So, and that is basically installing and inspecting CSI driver, right? And drivers are, you can find most drivers on artifacthub.io. Uh, uh, most of them install as, as Helm charts. Some of them uh, have fully blown operators. And uh, some of the drivers uh, you just reference uh, and uh, uh, a configuration file uh, that points to lives in a GitHub repo or a web server, and that will install the driver for you. Uh, and once you have a driver, or if you have access to a cluster now, what you can do is it's just you do a kubectl get CSI drivers. Uh, that will list the the drivers that you have installed on your cluster and the and the capabilities of the driver. Uh, and if you do a kubectl get CSI nodes, you will see what nodes in your cluster have CSI drivers on them, and you can do a like a verbose output and see what driver uh, they actually have. Uh, installed, right? Uh, so now we are uh, going to uh, install a CSI driver. That's our first hands-on lab uh, in this tutorial. So I'm going to switch over to my terminal and uh, hang on for one second. All right, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to use the uh, HPE CSI driver for Kubernetes and you install that with Helm, right? And I'm just going to add the Helm repo to my cluster, do a Helm repo update. Uh, and then I'm going to create a separate namespace for uh, that driver that what I want to install it. Do a Helm install, namespace vendor, and the CSI driver name. I obviously made a typo there. I want to give the release a name because this is something switching from Helm 2 to Helm 3 <laughs> obviously provides that headache. And once the driver is installed, you can do a kubectl get uh, CSI drivers. You will see the capabilities of the driver and the driver name. And you will also see on your nodes that you will have, uh, I have four working nodes in my cluster and they all have the driver installed. The drivers also have a way to configure themselves, right? So for the um, CSI, HP CSI driver for Kubernetes, um, I need to provide a secret uh, that provide a means for me to find the backend that I want to use, right? So for me to be able to start provisioning storage from storage classes and such, uh, I need to create that secret to make sure that uh, the CSI provisioner, attacher and such, will they be able to find that secret when they need to talk to um, uh, the HP CSI driver. So I'm just going to go ahead and create that. And there we go. Driver installed. So now when we have the driver installed, uh, we can do a lot of things, right? Uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is how we can uh, do dynamic provisioning of persistent volumes. And Dynamic provisioning in Kubernetes is nothing that is exclusive to CSI drivers in, in any way, right? So if we just uh, imagine for a second here that we're, we might be using a Kubernetes entry storage plugin, we might be levering a cloud provider's managed Kubernetes uh, service to uh, provide persistent storage and so forth, or we might be using um, a CSI driver. Uh, so on the left hand side here, you will see that the cluster administrator, uh, he will create something called a storage class. And that will reference the, um, the provisioner you want to use and you want to give it a name. And you also, you might have a list of parameters that are specific uh, to, um, to that particular provisioner. Uh, for CSI drivers, you need to have a list of keys that references the, the secret uh, to the different sidecars. And if uh, you're, you have your own sidecars, uh, you need to uh, call them out there as well. And you want to specify things like file system type and things like that. And there are some other keys in the storage class that I'm going to talk about uh, later in the presentation. Uh, the middle piece here, the, the user aspect of it is that uh, users uh, create persistent volume claims and a persistent volume claims are namespaced, right? So, uh, and that will in turn, uh, he will request the access mode. I'm going to talk about that later as well, what that is. And um, then you request a storage size, right? So that is where you specify the capacity in, you can do either 
terabyte, gigabytes, or kil kilobytes, megabytes, uh, whatever unit you, unit you want, and you might want to call out the storage class. There is a annotation you can do on the storage class. I'm going to show you how that works as well. That will allow you to specify default storage class. And that uh, means that any persistent volume claim without a storage class name called out explicitly uh, will pro be provisioned from that storage class. Once a persistent volume claim has been submitted to the cluster, the dynamic provisioner, which listens to um, the that provi provi specific provisioner name, will um, provision something called a persistent volume. And that is a, a, a stanza that basically describes the backend storage, right? So that's where you will have your uh, your driver name and your, your implementation specific keys and such, and how to find the volume on the backend. Uh, in the case of CSI, you will also have a bunch of secrets and things to, to be able to attach and detach that storage uh, from a particular node at any given time, right? And you will also have the access mode and all that metadata that the Kubernetes needs to be able to uh, uh, attach and detach the volume and provision the volume uh, and so forth. So uh, diving into the different uh, objects here, so if you look at the storage class here, right, as I mentioned, that having an, a default storage class is, is usually good hygiene, right? So if you uh, provision a managed Kubernetes cluster on any of the public cloud providers, uh, you will see that you will have a storage class, right? So do a kubectl get storage class, you will see that there will be a storage class there, it's marked default, and that will use the cloud provider's uh, storage solution to pr provide persistent storage to your, uh, to your workloads. Uh, in the case of CSI, you will have these keys that says csi.storage.cates.io uh, uh, and a, a set of um, published secret names or, or secret namespace for the different sidecars. And you need this for every sidecar, right? So the CSI expander sidecar uh, would need a secret and, and the publishing and, uh, and a few others that you need to reference in the storage class need to be pointed out there explicitly. Uh, you also have the ability to set the reclaim policy on the, on the persistent volume. So it's basically when a user deletes a persistent volume claim, what is gonna happen uh, when that uh, persistent volume cl claim gets deleted? Will, it be, will the persistent volume that references the backend storage be retained on the cluster or will it be deleted? Um, another uh, key here I'm, I'm showcasing is the volume binding mode and if that's gonna be immediate or wait for first consumer. And that is important if you're using uh, topology within your cluster, right? So if you have a driver that supports topology, uh, you might wanna uh, be able to um, separate uh, your different controllers or your pods in different zones in your cluster, right? And when you provision storage, you wanna make sure that you attach storage that is close to the node, right? So what happens is once Kubernetes have selected a node to provision your pod, that's when the persistent volume gets provisioned and the persistent volume will then be attached to that, those set of nodes, right? Because, and it will, then annotate the persistent volume uh, with the um, with the affinity keys, and that means that that persistent volume will only be able to be attached to those particular sets of nodes. Uh, if you want to allow the or if the CSI driver you want to use um, allows expansion, uh, you will set that in the storage class as well, right? So if it allows uh, expansion, you will set that to true, and you will then be able to resize your persistent volume claims. Uh, as you desire or not resize. That's the wrong term because you can only expand, you cannot shrink. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how that works as well. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the persistent volume claim, uh, it's, 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 it's very straightforward, very basic. And uh, you need to specify the access mode. I, in my next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit broader about what access modes are and then you need to specify the uh, the resource request, uh, uh, the capacity that I mentioned, right? So in this example, I'm going to provision, or I'm going to actually request a two terabyte volume. Uh, the volume mode is is set to file system per default, but this is where you would specify a volume mode block if you want to provision a block device, and, it, and the underlying driver supports that. Uh, and you will also do, also be able to specify the storage class name or 
or omit the storage class name if you have a default storage class. But in clusters where you have multiple tiers of storage, say you have a gold, silver, bronze style thing, or you have like fast SSD or slow media kind of uh, segregation, right? It might be useful for users to be able to make that distinction between uh, provisioning fast storage or, or slow storage because there's usually cost associated with that. Uh, and uh, the billing and accounting apartment is uh, will be happier if if the right workload is running at the right place. So uh, PVC access mode or persistent volume claim access mode. Um, this is a, a graphic I put together to kind of like illustrate what types of applications require different types of storage, right? So one of the absolute absolute most popular Kubernetes controller to use with persistent storage is a stateful set, right? And you will find like Mongo, MinIO, Rook, Redis, Kafka, all these different workloads that you run on top of Kubernetes, they use something called a state for stateful set. And stateful set in itself, uh, I'm not going to cover that in detail, but that is a controller that has a has ordered starts, uh, persistent network naming, and also persistent <clears throat> naming of the volumes that gets attached to each of the pods as well, uh, right? And what happens is that each pod that starts up will basically uh, have its own file system. So each pod will benefit greatly by having a read-write uh, once um, uh, persistent volume claim, right? Because that storage will then be private to that pod for the duration of that stateful set, right? So if you delete the pod, the pod will attach the exact same storage at the same time. Uh, and storage will also be provisioned dynamically. And I'm going to talk about this in detail uh, later in the tutorial as well. Uh, another very popular pa pattern for uh, deploying legacy applications on Kubernetes is to use something called a deployment, right? And in this case, if you're using single replica deployment, uh, they usually leverage read write ones um, persistent volume claims. So as you can see here, I have my SQL both in the legacy app single instance and the shared nothing distributed because you can run that database in two different modes, right? You can have uh, the replicated uh, one as a stateful set where you have uh, one uh, main instance and multiple replica instances. And you can also run it as a single uh, replica pod where you only have one single pod accessing one file system. So that is a matter of preference, how you would like to run that particular application. And the same goes for Postgres. It also, Postgres also has the same um, pattern as uh, MySQL in the stateful set as well, if you want to run it in a shared nothing distributed architecture. And uh, when we get to scalable distributed applications uh, that uh, require shared storage, right? So say that you have Nginx, uh, a distributed front end with a lot of content, right? It's, it's really practical to kind of have them reference the exact same storage uh, across the cluster. So when you scale uh, replicas up and down, uh, it, will exact, it, it will attach the exact same storage to that particular pod. Uh, also, a lot of the uh, AI ML based workloads like uh, running uh, Jupyter Hub or Kubeflow, uh, they kind of see storage as a data lake, right? So every instance that you spin up of Jupyter or you, you, uh, certain uh, aspects in your AI ML pipeline requires all the different replicas of that particular workload to access the exact same storage at any given point in time. And you accomplish that by using a, something called a read-write many persistent volume claims. So then multiple pods can access the same storage uh, at any given time. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look at uh, on the, the content serving aspect of it, where you want to provide read-write many access uh, in read-only mode, essentially, uh, I see some of the use cases I see that you want to provide uh, read-only uh, content to Nginx to serve static content. Uh, you might have a Jenkins uh, server that attach storage, uh, but you don't want your build jobs to screw up your storage sort of thing. And, and, and running those jobs on, on a read-only file system makes sense uh, uh, for that particular purpose, right? And, and the way that you kind of attach read-only many storage is essentially you request, you, you have to specify it in the, in the request that you do a read-only many, 
And then in the mount point, you said, I want to request this read only. And that is basically how you request a read only many or RWO or RW access is called it read write many. <clears throat> so I hope that clarifies uh, the different uh, aspects of uh, persistent volume claim uh, access modes. So uh, with that said, so the last slide kind of in the dynamic provisioning piece here is I just want to lay out the persistent volume overview here for our CSI driver. And this is kind of slightly abbreviated. This object contains a lot of information, right? So, so once the, uh, the CSI provisioner has provided, uh, instantiated this uh, persistent volume, uh, it will have a lot of metadata uh, around the driver, what parameters the driver uh, needs to attach it, all the secrets will be enumerated. Uh, there will also be uh, something called a claim reference, uh, which uh, which uh, claim the PV is bind, bound to, uh, and so forth. Also, you see the volume mode there, and the volume handle there actually references the um, the backend. That, that's basically the ID that you send to the backend storage to be able to uh, uh, see what uh, to be able to look up the volume and attach the volume. Uh, and so forth. And there's also a bunch of finalizers up there at the top that you'll be able to see. Uh, so and that essentially means that you, you cannot delete a persistent volume if there's a PV holding a claim against it um, and such. And, and you can have other finalizers on there uh, that are all specific to your driver as well. <clears throat> so, um, that leads me to uh, hands-on lab number two. Uh, we're gonna create a storage class. We're gonna create a persistent volume claim. Uh, we're gonna attach a workload to that persistent volume claim. And I'm also gonna show you how to uh, expand a volume uh, for that running workload. So hang on while I switch over to my demo. All right, so what I'm gonna do here first is I'm gonna show you the storage class that I'm gonna use here. Uh, I want to make this storage class a default storage class. This is the only storage class we're going to use for the entire uh, tutorial. Um, and it supports all the different capabilities that, uh, that, that I talked about in the introduction there. And we need to specify all the different keys for the sidecars. And we also want to specify what file system we want to use. In this case, XFS. Uh, we want to specify the reclaim policy. And uh, we want to uh, allow volume expansion, and we want to make sure that the uh, the volume binding mode is immediate. Uh, so when the PV gets bound uh, to the PVC, we can use it immediately, and we don't care where Kubernetes uh, schedules it. So we're going to create that. Um, the next uh, step here is um, creating a, a persistent volume claim. And you can also see here that in this particular storage class, we marked it as default. And this is the persistent volume claim. Uh, I'm just going to give it a name, specify access mode read write once because it's a block storage backend I'm, I'm using. And I'm going to make that volume 32 gig initially. And I'm going to resize this later. I'm going to show you how that works. So we're just going to create that. <laughs> System volume claim created. And we can see here that the status is bound and the volume is actually referencing there in the low volume columns referencing the actual PV, uh, which is uh, which shows here even more metadata about that particular persistent volume. All right. Let's uh, see what we can do next. Let's, uh, yeah. So I'm going to deploy uh, MySQL uh, with the um, with Helm, uh, I'm going to specify my SQL root password as admin. I don't recommend that. And I'm going to use my existing claim that I just created, right? So I'm just going to do a Helm install MySQL, reference the um, the values file, and spe specify stable slash MySQL. And I managed to get the Helm syntax right, right in this example. Just going to wait for the um, MySQL deployment to come up. We're waiting for the dolphin. There we go. Successfully uh, rolled out. And uh, then I'm going to exec into the container here and uh, or into the pod, I'd say, and, and, and do some inspection here for you. Uh, 
to show how, how things are wired up. So, so I know that uh, the mount point for MySQL is usually MySQL something. I'm just going to grab that. Uh, we'll see that we have in the um, we have a multipath device uh, mounted on slash warlib MySQL. Uh, it's an XFS file system. And we can see here with the disk free command that we have a uh, 32 gig volume mounted there. And I'm just going to jump into the database here and um, create a new database. And you will see that a database gets created on the, on the volume. There we go. Pop back out. And when we can now see that we have that database living in the file system which references that persistent volume. All right, uh, we're gonna pop out uh, in the shell here again. And I prepared a, um, a separate uh, persistent volume claim uh, YAML specification uh, that will essentially expand uh, the volume. So I'm gonna double the size of the volume. Um, uh, and we also reference the same PVC there. So I'm just going to apply that. Uh, you, well, you can do different methods here, right? Uh, so you can uh, you can edit the PVC. You can do a cube call edit and reference the PVC on the running cluster. Uh, you can also use the uh, cube cuddle um, patch command uh, to to patch it, and uh, and and and. and it doesn't really matter which way you go, right? I mean, you will get the exact same results. Uh, so I'm just putting a uh, cube color get uh, on my uh, persistent volume claim here, and I'm just going to wait for the capacity to expand here. So what happens here in the background is that the um, the CSI uh, resizer sidecar uh, tells the underlying CSI driver to expand the volume. Uh, the volume gets expanded on the backend storage system, and once that operation completes. Uh, then there's a node expansion operation that happens that talks to the CSI node driver, and that will essentially expand the file system uh, on the um, on the node itself, right? So it will do uh, XFS resize. There we go, uh, 64 gig now. And uh, once we kind of clear this watch here, we'll be, jump back into the container and see uh, that we can actually uh, leverage that extra capacity. Yeah, so there we go, uh, 64 gig uh, mounted on slash for lib MySQL. And you don't need to restore anything or uh, doing any other operation. So that is basically how simple it is to uh, expand a volume uh, in uh, Kubernetes with a CSI driver that supports it. And this is all user-driven, right? So since the persistent volume claims are namespaced, you will then be able to, uh, the, the end user will basically be able to uh, to expand the persistent volume claim. <clears throat> All right, uh, that was uh, dynamic provisioning uh, 101, I'd say. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the workload controllers here. You, you notice I, I deployed the application using a Helm chart, uh, uh, which is kind of practical on how to, how and how you would manage applications on uh, on Kubernetes, right? But what you see here in these two windows here is sort of like most controllers, they uh, reference uh, volumes in, in the pod specification, right? So you specify a mount path, and then you give uh, the volume mount a name, which is my mount, and then you have a volume section, uh, which points to the persistent volume claim, claim name, uh, and that's kind of how you key those two together, right? On the right-hand side on this slide, you will see the stateful set, and that is slightly different uh, from uh, the other controllers, right? There you have a construct called a volume claim, uh, claim template, and that is basically a, it's more or less a inline specification, uh, persistent volume claim specification, where you call out the storage class name, if you want, you can leave that uh, to the default one to resolve it, uh, or uh, and you also provide like how much capacity each of the volumes uh, are supposed to have, and but you still use that uh, keying with the volume mount for a particular path uh, in the volume claim template, right? So what happens here is when you deploy the stateful set, say you you deploy a single replica stateful set that will provision one, one volume, and as you as you scale the the stateful set, it will provision a new volume for each replica that comes online, right? 
and and that's why it's very practical to use read write one storage uh, with uh, with uh, with a stateful set because that individual pod will have private access to that particular volume and that is uh, that was a short slide because we are already on hands-on lab number three where we will deploy an application utilizing a stateful set so hang on here while i switch over to my terminal so uh, what i'm going to do here is uh, deploy redis uh, i'm going to deploy it with um, a um, helm chart as well uh, and this is the values file i'm going to provide uh, uh, use password equals false and I'm also going to provide uh, prepare a watch command here, right? So this watch command will uh, watch my stateful sets, my pods, and my PVC as Redis comes up, right? So I'm just going to do a Helm install, call it my Redis, uh, reference my values file, and I'm going to use the Bitnami uh, distribution of Redis, and uh, here we go. And here's my watch command that I had prepared. And you will see here uh, that the, uh, the main uh, instance is already coming up. Uh, and there's also a, um, a, a replica instance uh, being set up as well. And down to the list of persistent volume claims, you will see that there are two claims uh, that has been fulfilled. And now you can see that there's another pod coming up and it automatically created a new persistent volume claim, right? And once all these uh, pods have started, uh, all this uh, that means that all the storage has been attached uh, from the persistent volume claims that were dynamically provisioned, right? And although you're using a Helm chart here, uh, it is a stateful set that Redis leverages. And you can see by the persistent naming of the volumes here that they are derived from uh, what you call the release name and, uh, and so forth and that, that means that uh, you have predictive naming of the volumes. And the same thing with the, with the network naming in stateful sets as well. That means that uh, the, the pods and the instances that runs in those pods will be able to find each other. I'm just gonna set in, insert a key here, um, kubecon status, what do we think? It's awesome, right? So I'm just gonna put that key in here, uh, make sure that we, we flush uh, the store to disk and uh, because I'm gonna I'm gonna use this in in, in subsequent uh, uh, labs uh, throughout the presentation. So we have uh, KubeCon status is awesome. Going to exit there, and I will go back to my PowerPoint. All right. Uh, in this next section, uh, we're going to talk about CSI snapshots and uh, using PVC data sources. And uh, this is kind of where it starts to get interested. We interesting because we kind of passed all the the basic stuff now, right? Uh, so <clears throat> the way CSI snapshots work in Kubernetes is that it works very similar to how persistent storage works, right? So you have something called a volume snapshot class, which allows users to create something called vo a volume snapshot. And you will have the, uh, the CSI snapshotter uh, will create something called a, a volume snapshot content that will basically point to the uh, physical resource that references the external snapshot, right? So we will start the next hands-on lab by creating the, first of all, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention this, right? So, so the CSI snapshot sidecar uh, is not installed by default by the CSI driver. Uh, the CSI snapshot is provided by the Kubernetes distribution, right? So you need to check with your Kubernetes distribution vendor if the CSI snapshot or sidecar is installed or not. Uh, in this exercise, uh, since I'm leveraging uh, vanilla upstream Kubernetes, uh, uh, I'm going to deploy the external snapshot as part of the hands-on lab. But uh, once we kind of pass this, what you can do is when once you have all these CRDs installed, uh, you can create a, a volume snapshot class uh, and reference the um, again the CSI driver uh, that you um, uh, that you have installed uh, on your cluster. Some uh, uh, some CSI drivers provide custom keys to set different values for the parameters that you provide to the volume snapshot class, very similar to what you would do in a storage class if you have any uh, specific parameters you want to supply to the driver when you done it, uh, when you provision a snapshot or provision a volume in the storage class case, right? And the volume snapshot is also very s simple. Uh, all you have to do is specify a source. Is just what actual persistent volume claim uh, 
do you want to take a snapshot of? Uh, and and that then will create a point in time copy of that persistent volume claim uh, with the content that's in that volume at that point in time. And uh, the volume snapshot content, again, is that is sort of like the physical representation on how your backend storage system will be able to find that piece of storage uh, and, and reference that in that particular snapshot. So with that, I'm going to dive into hands-on lab number four, uh, where I'm going to start deploying the CSI snapshotter. Uh, I'm going to create a volume snapshot class, and uh, I'm going to create some volume snapshots. So uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to switch over to my terminal. Uh, one second. All right. Uh, let's uh, start by cloning the uh, Kubernetes CSI exter external snapshotter uh, repository. And then we need to uh, create uh, some resources that are provided in that repository. So it's the, um, the CRDs that provides the volume snapshot classes, volume, volume snapshot contents, and volume snapshot that I just talked about. And then you actually need to deploy the actual uh, CSI uh, snapshot controller itself. And this you kind of need to do once per cluster. And once that's deployed, you can go right ahead and uh, create volume snapshot classes. Uh, I'm going to create a default volume snapshot class. I'm only going to leverage one in this particular exercise. I want to point out which driver I'm going to use. And I also need to reference the particular secret the sidecar needs to talk to the, uh, the backend that we deployed. All right. Um, we're going to create the volume snapshot class. Here we go. And uh, I prepared a, a bunch of uh, volume snapshots. Uh, and, and this will essentially create new snapshots of the Redis instance that I deployed, right? So here are the, the three pods that make up my running Redis instance. And I'm going to create a snapshot on each of those persistent volume claims that got created uh, when I deployed that Redis instance. There we go. I'm going to create those. They're usually created quite fast. Snapshots uh, are nothing, isn't or usually a heavy operation for the backend storage. So I can do a get there. We can see that they're uh, um, uh, immediately ready to use. Uh, the source PVC that we're referencing and the restore size you can see in the column. Uh, there are a lot of columns here that has actually been truncated, uh, and you can check the outputs in the um, uh, in the Ask Anima cast files. Uh, but there are the, there are a bunch of other columns there as well. So, and uh, that was actually how easy it was to create a volume snapshot class and create a bunch of snapshots that references ex existing PVCs, and now we have point in time copies of our particular Redis instance. So I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint here. In this first exercise, uh, where we created a volume snapshot class and a volume snapshot, what I would want to be able to do is to create a new persistent volume claim uh, that references my volume snapshot. So this is an example persistent volume claim, how you would reference a snapshot when you create the PVC, right? So you have the data source stanza here, which calls out uh, the, um, the snapshot name you want to use, what kind it is. Uh, it could be a volume snapshot or a persistent volume claim. Um, so, so far, uh, there are other things coming here uh, uh, that's not been released yet. Uh, and then when you're using uh, volume snapshot, since uh, volume snapshot is a beta feature, you need to call out the API group as well that you want to look for uh, this particular kind, right? And here is a, a very important detail that I, I want to just call out here is that when you create persistent volume claims from existing snapshots and such is that the, the storage request needs to match what the actual snapshot is. So you cannot say that you took a snapshot of a volume and it was two terabytes. You actually need to uh, create a new PVC with the exact same, uh, exact same size as the the, the the volume volume snapshot. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to dive into lab number five here, or the hands-on lab number five. 
and create a new PVC uh, from the volume snapshots that were just uh, created and attach a new Redis instance to them. So I'm just going to switch over to my terminal. So uh, I'm going to use the, uh, the the volume snapshots that were just created, right? And how I'm going to attach those is basically I have a, a set of PVCs uh, that references those particular snapshots, right? So in my data source stanza here, uh, I reference the, the snapshots I want to use for each of the snapshots. So I'm basically going to start up a new Redis instance uh, that I created initially in this tutorial and see if I have my uh, key that I inserted in the first exercise, right? So now I'm going to create those PVCs from the snapshots. I have a bunch of YAML here uh, that you might have already seen. Uh, I now created the persistent volume claims. And you can see here, since uh, stateful sets have predictive naming, I know what those uh, persistent volumes are going to be called, right? So when I bring up my Redis instance, I know what persistent volume claim is going to ask for, right? So that's so when I name my new instance, my new Redis, uh, that means that it will uh, either dynamically provision a persistent volume claim of that name or use the existing one, right? Uh, and since I pre-created these persistent volume claims, that, it, what essentially happens is that those persistent volume claims, claims will be attached to the Redis instance. There we go. Uh, I just want to make sure that the instance come up here before we... Um, um, before we start poking around in it. Um, thankfully, uh, Helm makes it easy to find the resources that we want to look at. Uh, so we can see here that my new Redis uh, instance is coming up here. I do not list the pers persistent volume claims here because since I created a persistent volume claims and Helm did not create that resource, I wouldn't be able to qualify uh, the label with release equals my new Redis. Uh, but I know that the, the correct uh, persistent volume claims are getting connected. All right, we're up and running. Uh, so I'm just going to exec into that uh, Redis instance that I just created. Typos are common. I'm going to run the Redis CLI directly. And I should be able to get the KubeCon status key. Uh, there we go. It's awesome. So that is basically how you would clone a an application leveraging multiple persistent volume claims from multiple snapshots using predictive naming uh, thanks to the, uh, the stateful set, right? So now you would be able to provision as many instances you want of that particular application. And since uh, the snapshot PVCs that you just created are not uh, impacting production, you would be able to do destructive changes on this particular application, add keys, remove keys, and uh, connect an external application to it to do some testing. And obviously this is a very tiny data set, but it wouldn't really matter if this could have been a multi-terabyte database, right? And that is very popular for CI-CD use cases where you want to attach production-like data into, um, into your uh, testing and dev environments. So I'm just going to switch back to my PowerPoint here. Hang on. All right, uh, the next uh, demo uh, I'm going to do is basically uh, create a, a new persistent volume claim from an existing existing persistent volume claim. And that means that you won't have a intermediate snapshot, right? So you will create the new PVC directly from the, from the source one. And this does not require the external CSI snapshotter. So uh, as long as the, uh, the, the um, CSI driver supports data source, uh, uh, persistent volume claim data source, I'd say, uh, you will be able to use this capability and feature. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to switch over to hands-on lab number six and create a new PVC from an existing PVC and attach an application. I'm going to switch back to my terminal.
All right, so I'm just going to show you the uh, my PVCs from PVCs, uh, and that, this is very similar to what I showed in the PowerPoint slide here. The data source, what I'm going to use, uh, yeah, again, I'm going to use predictive name, naming, and I'm going to use uh, my clone Redis as the name. The data source I'm going to specify is a persistent volume claim, and these are the existing claims that got created initially. I'm going to create those uh, PVCs from PVCs, and you will see that they will be instantly created as well. Oh, I forgot to list them here. But rest assured, they will be um, provisioned. So I'm going to install a third Redis instance here, and I'm going to call it my clone Redis. I'm going to watch it. Listed by label release equals my clone Redis. Hopefully all my cluster nodes have the Redis image by now, so this should be fairly quickly. It's creating. There we go, all the instances are up and running. Not running yet. It's not ready yet. There we are. There we go. Ready, 1-1. One, one. All right, so we should now be able to um, exec into my new clone Redis. Uh, clone Redis instance. Yep, uh, that's right. That's the name. And run this Redis CLI. And I should be able to observe the key that we inserted in the initial deployment. And there we go. It's awesome. And just to illustrate here, I'm just going to list the volume snapshots and volume snapshot contents uh, that we had. And, and this only references the, um, the original snapshots that we created, right? And what this basically means is that there is a snapshot created uh, on the backend storage system, but it's a snapshot that um, Kubernetes is unaware of. So it's only the CSI driver that knows how to uh, create a snapshot from that existing PVC and attach that to uh, the PVC that is running in, in, in the Kubernetes cluster and, and, and resolve that and make sure it gets uh, staged and uh, attached properly. All right, uh, that concludes lab number six, I believe it was. Yep, uh, number six. Uh, I'm gonna uh, show something uh, very similar here. Uh, so in this particular case here, uh, what is fairly popular, let, let, let's say that uh, you accidentally delete a application, right? Uh, but you still have the volume snapshot. Say that you, you delete the, um, you do a Helmand install and you wipe your PVCs and all of a sudden, oh, that was not my intention. Uh, you just wanted to install the app and reinstall the app, but you accidentally wiped the PVCs. But if you have the volume snapshots, you will then be able to create a new, uh, a new instance from those uh, with the original names that you had uh, when you initially deployed the application and sort of revert to your previous state, if, if you so will, right? So say that you would have, a, uh, that, that's the other use case for using um, uh, the, the re restoration procedure, right? So you would essentially, uh, yeah, how would I describe this? Uh, say that you're um, running your instance in production uh, you would uh, accidentally trash your data set, right? But you know that you have a snapshot from two hours before. What you can do is that you can uh, undeploy or uninstall the Helm chart in this case, and then uh, remove your original PVCs and then create new PVCs from the snapshots that you just created. So I'm just going to dive into hands-on lab number seven and uh, restore an application uh, from a um, volume snapshot.
just going to switch over to my terminal. We're back at the terminal. And uh, first I'm uh, going to uh, exec into my uh, production uh, instance. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to delete my status key, right? So you will see that I will actually, so this is kind of an accidental deletion use case, right? So you will see that I've deleted the key doesn't exist there anymore. Uh, I know that I have a good snapshot that I want to uh, be able to leverage to restore uh, my Redis instance. I'm just going to inspect the uh, PVCs uh, that I want to recreate, uh, and I'm going to recreate these with, with the original names, right? And the original names of my uh, volumes is just my Redis, no clone, not my new, or whatever. And the data source I'm going to reference is the, um, the snapshots that I know I have. And we know that those snapshots are good because we already restored to a new application with, uh, with those particular snapshots. So we're going to do a Helm uninstall my Redis. And I'm also going to wipe the uh, persistent volume claims that um, got created when we deploy that. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, filter by label. Uh, and now the claims are gone. And before we uh, install uh, the Redis instance, I just need to create my uh, persistent volume claims, make sure that, th that those get recreated. I'm just going to list them here and we can see that, yeah, they're bound, they're good. Uh, we want to then uh, attach uh, the Redis instance. I'm going to install the exact same uh, instance name that we did for the initial production. And this should have now bring back ourselves to the state we were when we took the snapshots uh, and basically be ready to serve production yet again. We want to wait for the instance to come up here. The main instance is running. Uh, we have one of the replica instance instances running. All right. Uh, the second replica is up and uh, we should be able to um, exec into uh, the Redis instance and uh, list our key. Awesome. We've now successfully restored the application to uh, the status it had when we took uh, the snapshot. Beautiful. All right, uh, I'm gonna switch back to my PowerPoint here and uh, the next uh, section uh, it's going to talk about uh, using uh, raw block volumes uh, and with that i just want to say that we kind of concluded uh, the csi uh, snapshots and cloning and using uh, volume data sources so uh, using raw block volumes is it's quite uh, it's quite nifty so you may have this uh, in the um, persistent volume claim spec uh, in that stanza that we have volume mode uh, block and you will also have the same ability to specify a particular storage class or not. And, but that is essentially everything you need to do to request a block volume from a CSI driver that supports uh, block storage. And the way you would reference uh, a, a raw block volume in the pod specification is slightly different from how you would do if it were a file system, right? Because all of a sudden you're dealing with devices. You don't have file systems on them, right? So that, that's why the, the volume mounts uh, stance has been replaced by volume devices. And instead, instead of a mount path, you have something called a device path. And that's where you call out the virtual device uh, and it's also ordered, right? So the first device that comes out, uh, comes to mind is the XVDA. Uh, you would still have a volume stanza, persistent volume claim, and a claim name uh, that you would reference. And uh, in, in this particular example, I'm going to not, yeah, I'm just going to switch over to the um, hands-on lab number eight here and create a raw block device and attach a workload to that. But this is a very simple uh, example on how this works. So bear with me here for a second. 
So first I'm gonna show you my block PVC here. So I'm basically gonna create a two terabyte uh, block device uh, with a volume mode set to block. And uh, it's also always default set to file system. It's gonna create that. And then I'm gonna run uh, the very simple part. It's the same specification I had in the PowerPoint actually. And it's just leveraging a tool called IOPing. Uh, and it uh, calls the claim name that I just created. And uh, here we have the, um, the stanza that calls out the volume device and the device path. And the results of this is essentially that we will, this tool, IOPing, will, um, will, will perform, perform an IO on that particular uh, device once per second per default and you will see the results of that. So I'm just gonna wait for the pod to come up here and then we will simply look at the logs and um, see what it um, looks like. All right, we're up and running. We're gonna tail the log here on that particular pod. And yeah, there we go. Uh, it's up and running, it started. And what you can see happen here is by default, this, so there's a 4K IO uh, being read from that particular block device. And you can see that the block device is a two terabyte device. That's exactly what we requested. And it performs that IO once per second here. And you can see the response time here in the request sequence. And, and that is essentially how you would address uh, raw block storage from your, from your pod uh, in Kubernetes. All right, and uh, that concludes uh, lab number eight. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna switch back to my PowerPoint here. And um, you might, know, you, you might uh, wonder why would you need raw block storage in Kubernetes? And to be quite frank with you, uh, there are not a lot of uh, cloud native workloads out there that leverages this paradigm. But there is one in particular that leverages raw block volumes. And that is the CNCF project called Rook. Uh, which uh, leverages uh, Ceph in the, in the background, right? And I'm I'm not by any means a, a Rook uh, or a Ceph expert for that matter, uh, but I can talk a little bit about what it is, right? So it's an open source cloud native uh, storage solution for Kubernetes. It provides both file block and object to Kubernetes, and it uses Ceph as I mentioned. And it, the key. Um, differentiator here is that it allows you to manage distributed storage running on Kubernetes with native controllers on Kubernetes. Pretty effortless, right? So you install it as an operator and then you create something called a Ceph cluster CRD and um, it may, uh, and, it, and the key aspect here is that you can leverage existing PVCs, right? Or you can create PVCs like volume mode, uh, with volume mode block. Uh, the most common pattern is that you simply leverage a raw uh, block device that attached to the server. Uh, so you don't have to uh, use a per external provisioner at all, right? You would just uh, use, uh, you would just statically map in like uh, an N NVMe device or whatever you have attached to your server. Uh, but if you want to deploy multiple clusters and, and kind of get rid of the business of managing local hardware, uh, using a CSI driver that can provide a volume mode block is quite practical, actually. Um, so the hands-on lab number nine is, I'm gonna show you how you would deploy Rook with the um, uh, with volume mode block uh, with your CSI driver. So I'm just gonna switch uh, over to my terminal here, uh, one second. Most of the labs that I've been running uh, throughout this tutorial, I have not sped up uh, and this one I'm going to have to speed up because it pulls down a lot of imager, uh, images. Um, for the operator itself, it doesn't pull down as much content. But when, once you create your Ceph cluster, it take it took me uh, around ten minutes for for the cluster to actually get created and and uh, come up. So I'm I I am going to speed up uh, this particular demo uh, when we get to that point, right? But first, we I'm just going to show you how the uh, the operator gets installed, and then I'm gonna uh, show you the Ceph cluster stanza, the, the CRD that instantiates the cluster. So let's see if this uh, operator comes up here um, soon enough. <laughs> 
So I have prepared a Ceph cluster YAML file here, and this is a vanilla Ceph cluster. I just uh, copied this from uh, the, uh, the the Rook uh, documentation. And here you specify something called a volume claim template, right? And you set the volume mode to block, the access mode, read write once. Uh, I omit the storage class. And once you kind of create this uh, Ceph cluster, it will dynamically provision storage resources that it needs uh, from the default storage class. Uh, so it uses actually, uh, there's three volumes being created one, once per replica for the Ceph uh, application or the Rook application, depending on how you see it. And then you will have uh, for the actual data pool, the Ceph file system or the OSDs as it's called in, in Ceph terminology will provision a um, a block PVC. And this is the point where I'm going to pause and speed up the presentation. And once it comes back, we're going to start chatting on what we're seeing. So there, it's finally up now. So what, what you can see here, what got uh, provisioned dynamically is that you have a uh, file system volumes has been provisioned uh, named Rook Cephmon ABC, and then you have the data volumes that uh, basically references a, a block device, right? And that is because the application components require a file system, and uh, the actual distributed file system, the Ceph file systems, require, requires block storage. So that's why it's very practical to have a driver that can do both of those things uh, to provide persistent storage to uh, read write ones, stateful sets which Ceph basically presents. So at this point, you basically have a Ceph cluster running uh, on your Kubernetes cluster. So you would be able to install the Ceph toolbox and start creating new storage classes uh, to provide uh, data services on top of your Kubernetes, but it's still backed by your backend CSI driver, being that a storage appliance, or it could be uh, your cloud provider's storage block service. So now you're you're more in the pattern of kind of controlling your own destiny because you have your data services running on the Kubernetes cluster itself. And that concludes the the, the use case overview for Rook. Uh, that was lab number nine. I'm now going to switch back to my PowerPoint. All right. Uh, the next section and the last section is actually about ephemeral volumes. So uh, something that is very comforting uh, in the world of uh, containers and kind of one of the biggest selling points in my uh, opinion is that when you start a container, you're more or less guaranteed that it will start the exact same way on your laptop, uh, in the cloud, in your data center, it doesn't really matter. And it kind of elim eliminates the whole problem of it runs on my computer, right? And but once we kind of start talking about huge amount of data, right, it becomes very impractical. I, I remember patterns back in the Docker days where we had a customers shipping production databases inside the container itself, right? So imagine shipping, I mean, this wasn't a large database. It, it, was, it was less than a terabyte. I remember that much, but still, that is a very impractical amount uh, of content to to store in a in a container right because you need to pull that instance down from a registry and it's just all that bandwidth that it needs to consume store that locally and it becomes a bit of a burden and it just like grows exponentially it just it just becomes worse and worse and worse as the as the database grows uh, basically and this was for a dev test use case uh, obviously it wasn't for production or anything like that uh, but that became very impractical, but so so that is sort of where ephemeral local volumes and generic ephemeral volumes that I'm going to talk about uh, in the next section is that that allows you to attach a piece of storage to your pod that will look exactly the same each time, right? Uh, by default, you will obviously just provision an empty volume, right? But you can use a storage vendor's uh, capability to uh, to perform a snapshot to clone a volume or have other pre-populated content in that volume. And, and that means that each time the pod gets restarted, that data gets reattached the way it looked, right? Uh, 
uh, the, the obvious use case here, if you just use this as as a, as a means to store data, like um, an empty file system, is that this is the ideal use case to use scr useful scratch disks, right? Uh, and the other uptake on this is that imagine that you have a high, very high performing uh, workload that consume a lot of capacity uh, in the compute phase of of, of that uh, particular workload is that it needs to store a lot of data uh, locally. And by default, if you would store the data inside the uh, overlay file system of the container, is that it will battle for IOPS and capacity of all your other applications on that particular uh, mount point where you have all your containers running. Uh, so provisioning an ex external volume uh, as an ephemeral entity, you will be able to temporarily use that scratch disk for that compute workload, and it will consume storage resources wherever you have it configured, right? So it could be your cloud providers, uh, high performance tier for uh, uh, using flash disks, so you might be using a cheaper tier for your temporary storage, right? I mean, the thing is you can kind of slice it and dice it however you want, right? Uh, but at the end of the day is that you don't want to have uh, your workloads that you know are ephemeral and you know that are IO intensive, you don't want to have them in the gen pop of your applications, right? You want to segregate them. Some vendors provide means to set very fine-grained uh, quality of service controls as well, right? To, to throttle those workloads and also ensure the capacity li limits are met, right? So looking at this very simple stanza here is that uh, you, you're you well familiar with this at this point, right? Where you have a volume mount, uh, the mount, the, calls out a, a named volume. And here is kind of where the, the, the secret sauce comes in, right? You, you have the CSI stanza here, you call out your driver, and these are the volume attributes uh, that you, you will supply to your driver, right? You will say, you will tell the driver, I want an ephemeral volume, if the driver supports eph ephemerality. And then you specify the, um, the secret, uh, uh, where you can find it and which namespace it is in, and you specify a size, right? and some vendors uh, support multiple different options here, how you want to provision storage and so forth. There's also a slightly different way to uh, uh, reference the secret, right? So if you have your secret to your uh, backend storage system sitting in a namespace with the application that you're actually, where you're deploying the pod or the stateful set, the Helm chart, whatnot, uh, you can just uh, reference it by name, right? So you give the, uh, the alternative syntax here by node publish secret reference and name it CSI. And I already skipped over to my uh, hands-on uh, lab number 10 slide here uh, about how to use uh, ephemeral local volumes. I'm just gonna switch over to my terminal here real quick. I have a very simple example here. Uh, in uh, my inline.yaml, uh, I will have a mount path of an Nginx web server uh, which is just a very simple, uh, stupid container and very stu stupid example, but it illustrates the point I want to make, right? So we have these, this inline stanza where I'm going to provision a volume. I'm going to wait for the pod to come up. I'm then going to exec into the container and uh, simply put a file there to, to prove my point. So I'm going to go to slash user share nginx html, echo kubecon rocks, into index.html. There we go. Content is there. And uh, then I'm going to do the, the brute thing of simply replacing the pod, right? And this will essentially delete the pod and recreate the pod. If we were referencing a persistent volume claim externally, the content would persist on that particular mount point. But the point I want to make here is that we, we're going to have a new volume provision there. So I'm going to exec into the pod, go to my mount points. There we go. It's empty. There's no index.html file there. And that concludes the first part of the ephemeral volumes use case. I'm just going to switch back to my PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something uh, that got introduced in Kubernetes 119, and that is called gener generic ephemeral volumes. And this is a little bit uh, simpler to comprehend in, in my uh, opinion is because what this does essentially, it, it kind of copies the behavior a little bit like you do with a stateful set. So you would specify essentially a ephemeral volume claim template 
that looks very similar to a, a inline persistent volume claim. And it supports like uh, labels, annotations, and all those things that you would uh, expect to work in a, in a persistent volume claim, right? And, and the key here is that it will be able to leverage any storage class. You don't have to have a CSI driver that supports ephemerality. You can just use uh, the existing, uh, existing CSI driver to support persistence, right? So I'm just gonna switch over to my last lab here and show you real quick how this works. I'm gonna switch over to my terminal. So I have a YAML file here, my ephemeral YAML. And here you can see that I have a um, vol ephemeral volume claim template. I input some metadata there, so I will be able to find the application. And you can see here the access mode, uh, how much storage I'm requesting, and the, the custom label. I'm gonna create that. And then I'm gonna do the exact same uh, exercise I did in, in the previous example. Uh, with the inline uh, local volume example. I'm gonna wait for the pod to come up. It's running. I'm gonna get the PVC uh, by my app label. You can see here that we have a determined name, my pod, my mount, and that maps to the, the, the pod name and the volume mount name that you saw in the um, YAML stanza. Again, I'm gonna exec into my pod. There we see we have a uh, multipath device mounted on user share nginx kubecon rocks into index.html. There we go. I'm going to do the same replace operation that I did on the previous uh, example. I'm going to delete the pod and it's been replaced. All right, let's exec back into it after it has come up. I'd say it's been a long day. How are you hanging in there? There we go, up and running. All right, we'll see here that, yep, uh, the directory is empty. There's no file there. Uh, the generic uh, ephemeral uh, volumes functionality worked as advertised, although it's a alpha feature, uh, be careful. And you will also see that the um, the PVC has been replaced uh, from uh, my default storage class there. As you can see that the, um, if you compare the IDs of the, uh, the volume names there, uh, they're different. All right, uh, that concludes uh, hands-on lab number 11. I'm gonna switch by, back to my PowerPoint. And uh, congratulations, uh, you're done. Um, thank you so much for participating. Uh, I'm just gonna iterate here what we've covered. Uh, we introduced you to CSI drivers how dynamic provisioning works in Kubernetes, how CSI snapshots, CSI restore, and using PVC cloning uh, in depth, and how you access raw block volumes and raw block storage. And the last few examples here, how to use ephemeral uh, volumes, both local volumes uh, using the inline stanza and using generic, uh, generic ephemeral volumes using your standard storage classes. Uh, as I mentioned, the source files, the YAML, the PowerPoint, the ASCII NEMA cast files are all available in uh, this particular um, GitHub re repository. Uh, check out the CSI specification, and, and you can also see um, the, um, all the me past meetings and, uh, and the members of the Kubernetes uh, Special Interest Group for Storage uh, on the GitHub URL there and check out the CSI documentation uh, for more information about uh, the development of CSI and the different maturity of levels of different drivers and, and features and, and God knows what. So uh, with that said, um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you're watching this live uh, at KubeCon, uh, please stick around. Uh, we're gonna shut down this video stream and we're gonna switch over to the live Q&A and um, until uh, if you're watching this uh, offline later, uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and all the social media uh, networks out there. Uh, the address is, is in the beginning of the video. So uh, thank you so much for watching. Take care.